Hello, welcome to NTD UK News. I'm Stuart Lees and here are today's top stories. The £37 billion test and trace system is found to be not clearly reducing the spread of the CCP virus. Lockdown is leaving local governments with a £10 billion black hole and the EU Parliament lifts ex-Catalan leaders' immunity and all of them are MEPs. England's £37 billion test and trace system has not made a clear impact on the spread of the CCP virus. That's according to Parliament's Public Accounts Committee. NTD's Neil Woodrow brings us this report. The impact of the NHS's test and trace programme is still unclear, says the Parliament's Public Accounts Committee in a new report. Chair of the committee, Labour's Meg Hillier, said, Despite the unimaginable resources thrown at this project, test and trace cannot point to a measurable difference to the progress of the pandemic. Dido Harding, the executive chair of NHS Test and Trace, defends the system. Um, NHS Test and Trace is an absolutely essential component in the fight against COVID. We're hitting all of the targets that SAGE set us. The committee also criticised the over-reliance on consultants working on the system, costing £1,000 a day. Harding has this reply. 80% of all of the costs in Test and Trace goes into testing. So over the course of the last nine months, over 83 million tests have been conducted. We've reached 9.1 million people and asked them to isolate. And every single one of those people that is isolated has helped stop the spread of COVID. I spoke with Dr Billy Palmer of the Nuffield Trust think tank. He says some analysis suggests that contact tracing by itself has a very marginal effect. Other analysis suggests that where test and trace program is working poorly, there's a high number of cases and deaths. He says more information is needed to look at how they met the targets that they set out for themselves. The test and trace program, they uh, set a goal to turn around tests within 24 hours. They've uh, consistently been missing that. The Department of Health, in trying to justify this huge expenditure, said it was to avoid uh, future lockdowns. There's since been a second and a third lockdown. As for what factor is having any effect, Palmer highlights some confusion in the data. No, we don't have that evidence. So I think the research she's uh, pointing towards that conflates not only the effect of uh, the test and trace program, but also the changes in people's behaviours, which might have happened even if there wasn't a test and trace programme. He believes there is an important part missing from the current test and trace system. So they can reach people, they can phone them up, they can contact them online and say, please self-isolate. They don't have the, con the you know, within their control to actually help people do that. So that's part of government's wider strategy and that's something that we think really needs to be addressed to Matt Hancock says there were a million and a half tests done yesterday and the team has built this testing capacity from nothing a year ago. So they've done an amazing job and I'm incredibly grateful to them. Observers say if we are to track the government's roadmap schedule, an efficient test and trace programme is needed. Neil Woodrow, NTD News. A National Audit Office report says that lockdown is leaving local governments with an almost £10 billion black hole. 25 councils are at high risk of financial failure. The report says local governments in England report combined income losses of £9.7 billion, equal to nearly 18% of their total spend in the year before. Local authorities say during the pandemic they will have had to provide new services and the cost of delivering some existing services has increased. They forecast that the pandemic will create £6.9 billion in additional costs in 2020 to 2021. Meanwhile, their forecast income losses during the year is £2.8 billion. This includes car parking income reduced by nearly £700 million and income from council facilities down £550 million. Income from council tax and business rates is also expected to drop by £1.3 billion and £1.6 billion respectively, but will not affect this tax year. The government is stepping in with a £9.1 billion emergency package, but local governments still anticipate a gap of over £600 million. 
The report says the government provided bailouts for four councils by February. Croydon Council and Nottingham City Council are also likely to need help. The report doesn't name the other at-risk councils. The UK government has announced that manufacturers will have to make home appliance spare parts available for the first time. The new law will come in this summer. According to the new law, consumers will have the right to have their appliances repaired rather than replaced. The aim is to make fridges, washing machines and televisions cheaper to run, easier to repair and have them last longer. Manufacturers tend to make appliances with a short lifespan, a practice called premature obsolescence, so that consumers have to spend more money on buying a new one. The government estimates the new rules will help reduce 1.5 million tonnes of electrical waste a year. But consumer rights group Which says, under the new rules, only professional repairers, not consumers, will be supported by manufacturers to carry out the repairs. Which also reminds consumers that appliances' warranties and guarantees can sometimes be more generous than their statutory rights. The government has also introduced another new rule to simplify an appliance's energy efficiency standards. The new system will raise the bar for each class and is based on an A to G scale rather than the current system that includes A plus and beyond. Former Chancellor George Osborne says that Rishi Sunak's plan to increase corporate tax will put off international investors. NTD's Patrick Hayden takes a look. Former Chancellor George Osborne says Rishi Sunak's doing a good job in a difficult situation, but he's not sure that Sunak's corporate tax increase from 19% to 25% will pass. But I would say the idea you can increase Britain's business tax by 25% by and there will be no consequence, I think, and I don't think he would claim that either, is a mistake. Osborne says that his own actions of advertising corporate tax reductions back in the day over many years meant tax rates went down, but tax revenue went up. He says if you want to bring in more tax, you should focus on the bigger ticket items in the budget. And that also keeps the UK attractive for businesses. For a chancellor, the corporation tax is not... If you really want to go for the big revenue raising, it's your VATs, your national insurance and your income tax. Former Conservative Prime Minister Theresa May criticised Sonak's plan of giving businesses a 130% claim against their tax bill for plant and machinery costs. She said in the Commons Sunak should extend the definition of research and development expenditure or increase the rate. She says what's needed is investment in innovation, not chief executives' jacuzzis. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. The saga over the extradition of Catalan separatists goes into the next round. The European Parliament voted Tuesday to lift their immunity. The European Parliament on Tuesday voted to strip the immunity from prosecution from Carles Puigdemont and two other Catalan lawmakers. Spain wants the former head of the Catalan government and two of his former cabinet members extradited. It is a sad day for the European Parliament. We have lost our immunity, but the European Parliament has lost more than that. And as a result, European democracy too. Spain has charged them with sedition over a 2017 Catalan independence referendum. It welcomed the decision as a win for the rule of law. The problems of Catalonia are resolved in Spain. They are not resolved in Europe. Puigdemont won a European Parliament seat in 2019. He and a number of his separatist colleagues are in self-imposed exile in Belgium. Belgium has so far denied Spain's extradition requests. Puigdemont says he will appeal the decision. Obviously, my colleagues and myself, as usual, we will be at the disposal of Belgian uh, judge, of course. But on the other hand, we will present a request against the European, the decision of the European Parliament in front of the European Court of Justice. The 2017 referendum brought on Spain's biggest political crisis in decades. Observers say the extradition requests could be dragged out for months or even years. A metropolitan police officer is arrested in connection with the case of a missing South London woman. Giving an update on the disappearance of Sarah Everard, police said they arrested a man on Tuesday evening. Yesterday evening, officers arrested a serving Metropolitan Police officer 
at an address in Kent in connection with the disappearance of Sarah Everard. This man was taken into custody and remains in custody at the London police station. A woman was also arrested at the address and is being held on suspicion of assisting an offender. This is a serious and significant development in our search for Sarah and the fact that the man who's been arrested is a serving Metropolitan Police Officer is both shocking and deeply disturbing. I recognise the significant concern this will cause. The Assistant Commissioner didn't say if the officer was known to Everard or what charge he had been arrested on. 33-year-old Sarah Everard has been missing for a week since she left a friend's house at about 9pm on the 3rd of March. She was last seen on Ponders Road, Clapham, and according to media reports, had made a 15-minute call to her partner, ending just before 9.30pm. An extensive search has been carried out on Clapham Common. Police are now searching areas in Kent, where the man was arrested. Police appealed for anyone with information to come forward. Working out of a store while wearing a mask and not paying at the till. Some say shopping at Amazon's first physical store in the UK makes you feel like a thief. NTD's Jane Well went to Amazon Fresh in West London to find out more. It's very cool inside, but you do feel like a shoplifter. Amazon's first store outside of the US is here in London. After scanning in with your phone and taking your items from the shelves, you just walk out but you're still charged through your Amazon account. The online retail giant says it works out who takes what through computer vision, sensor fusion and deep learning. More excitement than concern outside the newly opened store. The queue goes on and on. It's convenient to walk out, but not so convenient to walk in. We've come here three times to get in and we still can't get in, so we are waiting for it to come down and get in. It doesn't look any different to any kind of self-checkout store that I've noticed. It still has a novelty factor though. Um, I think even if it's just to come in just to look around or to try um, maybe to like trick the cameras or something, I think it's just, it's just fun for like one day to come and just try it out. So. Who knows? How do you trick the cameras? Uh, well, sometimes I'd hug my dad and then put the stuff back to see if the, car like, if the cameras wouldn't see us. <laughs> Less people is working, the more people is buying, but yeah, it seems to, we need to try it and see how it will, how it will go. This is cutting edge, it's, it's new technology, um, and I think it'd be sort of really interesting to sort of try it out and see how it works. Um, I have no, no doubt that supermarkets will be following in those footsteps. Amazon says it uses in-store technology to link to your Amazon account, keeping that data linked for 30 days, and it doesn't use facial recognition. Some campaigners have raised privacy concerns, but that's not the only concern. I feel like it's a bit of an Amazon takeover and now they're sort of encroaching into, into um, kind of supermarket retail. I, I personally, I'm not a fan. I'm interested in the technology, uh, but I'm not, I'm not really interested in seeing more sort of Amazon shops. I want to see more variety. Amazon plans to open more stores in London throughout the year. Jane Worrell, NTD News, London. Coming up, the UK rejects the President of the European Council's remark about a vaccine export ban. That and more when we return. UK-based researchers say the UK variant of the CCP virus is more deadly than previously thought. Researchers are saying that the highly infectious variant of COVID-19, which was first discovered in Britain, is between 30 to 100 percent more deadly than previous strains. The study published in the British Medical Journal compared death rates among people in Britain infected with the so-called UK variant, known as B117, against those infected with other strains. The variant was first detected in Britain September last year. It has since been found in more than 100 countries and is known to be more transmissible than other previously dominant variants. Robert Challen, who co-led the research at Exeter University, said threat should be taken seriously due to its high mortality rate 
coupled with its ability to spread rapidly. The UK and the President of the European Council are trading barbs over exports of COVID-19 vaccines. The UK government spokesman says the UK government has not blocked the export of a single COVID-19 vaccine. Any references to a UK export ban or any restrictions on vaccines are completely false. Earlier, European Council President Charles Michel had said the United Kingdom and the United States have imposed an outright ban on the export of vaccines or vaccine components produced on their territory. According to EU officials, Britain effectively prevents exports by using a UK first clause in its contract with AstraZeneca, the only company producing COVID-19 jabs in Britain. Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab has written to Michel, urging him to set the record straight. But Michel on Twitter called it different ways of imposing bans or restrictions on vaccines medicines. Michel also rejected charges of vaccine nationalism, levelled at the EU over its export controls. The EU is facing vaccine supply problems with all three manufacturers. Its member state Italy recently banned an export to Australia. In the UK, over 22 million people have received their first dose of the vaccine. That's a third of the population and far higher than any EU country. Australian Health Minister Greg Hunt is in hospital with a bacterial infection two days after taking a COVID-19 vaccine. Hunt received his first dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine on Sunday and went to hospital on Tuesday. A spokesperson said in a statement that, quote, his condition is not considered to be related to the vaccine. His office later said he had been diagnosed with cellulitis in his leg. He is expected to recover fully. A new episode in the tensions between China and the UK Beijing summoned UK's ambassador to China on Tuesday. This comes after she posted an article defending media freedom. Caroline Wilson posted an article last week on WeChat, a Chinese social media platform. She explained why foreign media's criticism of the Chinese regime did not mean the journalists responsible hate China. But the Chinese regime said her article was inappropriate. It said it only opposes those journalists who make up so-called fake news. In response, Wilson wrote on Twitter, I stand by my article. No doubt the outgoing Chinese ambassador to the UK stands by the 170 plus pieces he was free to place in mainstream British media. Last month, Beijing banned BBC World News following reports alleging abuses in Xinjiang province. This came after UK's media regulator Ofcom barred Chinese state broadcaster CGTN. Ofcom said the channel was controlled by the Chinese Communist Party, which goes against UK regulations. Chinese telecom giant Huawei is expanding its global infrastructure to build up to yet another area, undersea internet cables. Huawei will soon be building internet cables for France. It's going to be a 7,500 miles long undersea cable. It will start in China and end up at the French port of Marseille. The French government allowed Huawei's involvement despite warnings by the then US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. He warned of Huawei building a so-called back door during the construction that would allow it to steal information. And in other news, a breach of privacy taken to the next level. A group of hackers say they got access to hundreds of thousands of security cameras across the U.S. and worldwide. An international group of hackers is claiming credit for gaining access to live feeds of 150,000 surveillance cameras across the U.S. and the world. These cameras are in jails, hospitals, schools, and companies, and they all come from a Silicon Valley-based security system supplier called Verkata. Carmaker Tesla and software company Cloudfare also had their security cameras breached. A video seen by Bloomberg is believed to show a Tesla warehouse in Shanghai, China. Other videos seen by Bloomberg reportedly show the inside of women's clinics and psychiatric hospitals. And the hackers claim they gained access to over 300 cameras inside a jail in Alabama. Reportedly, the hackers say they lost access to the video feeds and archives after Bloomberg contacted Verkata. One of the hackers from the group claimed credit for breaching Verkata's system, saying the group did it because they wanted to show the pervasiveness of surveillance cameras and how easy it is to break into the system. 
That hacker also said it was too much fun not to do it. The group also claimed credit in the past for hacking chipmaker Intel and carmaker Nissan. Many of Verkata's surveillance cameras have facial recognition technology. That means customers can search and filter results based on a person's face. A representative for Verkata says it is investigating the scale and scope of the potential issue. Investment bank UBS is challenging a fine worth £3.8 billion. It was fined in 2019 for helping its French customers hide their assets. Entity's France correspondent David Vivez tells us more. Its trial began Tuesday in Paris. The Swiss bank was found guilty in 2019 of tax fraud and money laundering. The prosecutor based his accusation on a former employee of the bank, Stéphanie Gibault. In 2008, my boss asked me to destroy documents that related to a client list and events I used to organize after the office of the general director was searched by police. UBS was also convicted of secretly sending Swiss bankers across the border to encourage prospective clients to move their money overseas. The trial echoes a 29 tax fraud case in U.S. courts when the bank settled, agreeing to pay seven $800 million in fines. $780 million? It's almost nothing as a fine. There are similar cases. In Germany, the bank made a deal to pay $360 million in fines. The bank's guilty verdict in its 2019 trial in France is a first for the bank. En France, why is it important? It's the first time UBS has ever been convicted after a trial. The stakes are the reputation of the bank, the bank's stocks, but more importantly, the core of this topic is the bank's secrecy, what it's allowed or not allowed to do with its clients. The appeal case is set to end on March 24th. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. Repairs for the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris are underway, and workers are not cutting corners but they are cutting down hundreds of oak trees. The spire of the Notre Dame Cathedral had defined the Paris skyline for more than 150 years. It collapsed during the fire in April 2019, but now work is underway to restore the icon. The original plan for the spire required roughly 1,000 oak beams, so many that the cathedral's roof was known as the forest. With so much wood needed, will the reconstruction be faithful to tradition? French President Emmanuel Macron says yes. The 315-foot spire will be reconstructed as originally designed in the 19th century. The wood must be of exceptional quality from trees that have grown for two centuries. Such a tree is hard to come by and expensive. It's perfectly straight. The axis of the wood is perfect. The heart of the wood is in the center which will allow us to do the sawing and then make the piece for the future structure. The fate of this trunk is a long beam that will help support the weight of the spire. These trees were selected at the beginning of the year. They must be chopped down before the end of March or else the wood becomes too humid. They will dry for a year to a year and a half. Then they can be cut into shape and used in the new construction. That's the news for today. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stuart Lees.